So welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, quick introduction, my name's David Stringer from Matchmaster Communications. Um, I've been with Matchmaster now for coming up to 10 years. Um, and uh, my role here today is really just to take you through, I think a general introduction to MATV. Is that really what we're looking to? Just so I can make sure that we're, we're pitching at the right level on this, an idea of different antennas, amps, that sort of thing. Is that really what we're looking for? Yeah, antennas and amps and, and what for what. Terrific. Okay. Well, let me just tell you a little bit more about Matchmaster. I mean, we, we have this thing all over the place about being for the best. And, and um, it, it's really all about um, what we can do to help you guys grow your business. So it's a case of we make sure we have the right products, we have the right support. Um, delivery is always fast, so we, we get everything over to Daniel next day. It's either get shipped out of uh, Knoxfield, in fact I brought over a delivery with me this morning, or out of our head office in Sydney. Um, technical support is all in-country as well. Um, so we have a, a range of engineers, including myself, here in, in Victoria, and then we've got guys in Sydney and Brisbane and around the rest of the place as well. And we like to have a bit of fun while we're doing it, so it's all good. Now, the company itself, do you know much about Matchmaster, apart from the fact we're very red? No? <laughs> okay, so, so Matchmaster is a family-owned company. I've uh, been in business since the 1940s, uh, and in 1956, uh, Matchmaster manufactured its first TV antenna. The background to that is, previous to that, Matchmaster was manufacturing chokes for military vehicles. Um, but then one of the Waterfords, and the Waterfords are the family that own Matchmaster, this is Bob Waterford, uh, went over to London for the Olympics and he saw all these new antennas on roofs and realised that that was something that could be done quite easily back in, uh, back in our factory in Sydney, which is still there today. Since those days, obviously, we've grown. We do everything from TV, uh, CCTV, IPTV, TV over Cat6, and we offer a lot of online tools and training as well. Some of those we'll look at today, but the Antenna Selection Guide is one, Matchplan Pro is another. In terms of training, we offer training such as this one today, which is a, just a standard sort of 45 minute quick introduction. Is it 45 minutes we've got? Yeah. yeah it's about 45 minutes. Going up, there's another one we do, which is two hours. Those are both free. And then for anyone really interested, we do a full day session. That one's just a 90 bucks for the day. So all that training is available for you. Today, what we're going to talk about is how to actually set up an antenna inside, or should we say, on the roof, and all the, the, the basically the different pieces that you're going to require to go with it. Um, a lot of this is, is a lot of it sales training, Daniel, but what I do is I make it fairly technical as well because I know we've got a combination of, of, of people here. But before we do that, let's just look at what we're going to look at today. So basically we're looking at antennas, amplifiers, we're looking at the mounts, uh, the coax itself, then, of course, after that, we get inside the house, we've got splitters, we've got plates, we've got connectors, and we've got fly leads. And basically what we do, whenever we talk to people, we actually colour code it, makes it really easy just to understand what we're doing, um, starting from the antennas at the top and going right the way through to the fly leads at the bottom. But let's talk about terrestrial TV. Why terrestrial TV? Why not Netflix? Why not NBN Co? Why, why do we bother with terrestrial TV. How much longer will terrestrial TV last? I'll give you a straight answer. If NBN Co had been rolled out correctly, or had been rolled out in such a way that, for example, you have over in, in, in Asia in particular, you could probably quite easily argue that there is no requirement for free-to-air TV. But the difference between streaming TV and watching live TV is this. When we're streaming TV, so when I go home tonight and watch some stuff on Netflix, it's me and a few other people watching it. And we're watching it at different times. But then when the footy comes on, I'm watching it with a lot of other people. And that's where the bandwidth chokes. So I don't know if you've ever tried watching a grand final. It's a shocker. It's an absolute shocker. So the reason terrestrial TV will stay around for the foreseeable future is one, it's available all of the time. You don't have any issues with bandwidth. It's a simple antenna on the roof. Two, and this is not so well known, it's actually more cost effective for a broadcaster like Seven or Nine or ABC or any of the others to actually reach their audience through free to air than it is to stream. So for them, there's, there's a real, very strong reason why the broadcasters want to stick with free to air for now. Moving forward, um, 
I would say my personal gut feeling is between 10 to 15 years is how much longer free to wear will be around. And what will happen there, as far as the industry is concerned, is that there will still be installers. Um, but instead of installing TV antennas, what we're going to be installing instead is going to be um, a dish of one sort or another for internet. Now already today, uh, we have Starlink rolling out across the country. And what we now see is, a lot, if you look around, there's a Starlink dish, is a little one that basically just goes up like that, if you see them like that. And that's where the future's going. And that's the way we see things are going. So yes, in 20 years' time, there are still going to be TVs on the wall. There's still going to be content coming in. Um, and there will still be access over the air. But the over the air is going to be done via the internet as opposed to over free to air. But for now, how does it work? Basically, um, it's just a simple way. It's a transport stream at the end of the day. This is what we're talking about for um, free to air TV. An advantage of a transport stream means is that you can fit several channels and several services all within the same bandwidth. You remember we went through digital switchover back in the 1990s and early 2000s. We went through that, the rest of the world went through it. And the reason that we went through it is very simple. Um, governments around the world understand that they can actually auction off the same spectrum that traditionally has been used for TV to the mobile phone companies. So in this case, it was auctioned off to Telstra, Optus, and Vodafone. Um, and it was for several billion dollars. Now, that's relevant now because the problem we have, of course, we have, and we'll look at this a little bit later on, of course, is that we have TVs coming into the country that still have tuners that will pick up mobile phone signals. So just be aware of that. But let's, let's work out what this means. If we go back into the mists of time of analog TV, quite frankly, anyone could be a TV installer. All you needed was a truck, a ladder, and that was quite frankly it. Um, analog was incredibly forgiving. You could just basically point your antenna and rough it the right direction, hope for the best and normally get away with it. I remember years ago, my old man, he rang me, he's got a place down in Venus Bay, and he rang me up going absolute ballistics. He'd gone out and bought a brand new digital TV from Harley Norman, and uh, he said it didn't work. It was working fine, but the antenna wasn't aligned correctly. So it could pick up the analog, but it wasn't picking up the digital. And this is the difference, is that you have this thing called the digital cliff. And I don't know if any of you guys ever heard of that expression before. So the digital cliff basically is the difference between getting a good signal and a poor signal, or no signal. And with analog, you had a lot of forgiveness. You could just basically point your antenna in the right direction, hope for the best, and get away with it. Uh, with digital TV, you can't. And so that's why it's important to use, for example, things such as the antenna selection guide or any other of the tools to actually make sure that you are pointing the antenna in completely the right direction. It's amazing how just a small, what a small difference it, it can make. And it's not really, these days we strongly recommend against actually just looking where everyone else is pointing the antenna, but to actually take the time to make sure you're pointing it in the right direction. We had one a few months ago with a contractor out in Regional Vic who rang me so he wasn't getting his signal, and I said, what's happening? He said, well, I'm pointing it the same direction as everyone else, and I said, which way are you pointing it? Uh, we worked out within five minutes' conversation, he's actually pointing it in completely the wrong direction. Swung it around by 180 degrees, and ka-ching, in comes the signal. That was great for him, because I said, well, mate, you, you go around, how many other antennas are light in the area? He said, it was about 10, I said, you better want to go and knock on every door, because that's your market there. So, let's talk a little bit about antennas. Um, all these antennas I'm going to talk about today are available through radio parts. So, feel free to head up Daniel as soon as you're, you're ready to go. Um, now, I'm only going to focus on Victorian antennas. If I was going to Victor focus on antennas, the whole country would be here probably until tonight, which we don't really want to do. So, we're going to just focus on the main antennas for Victoria and obviously for, primarily for Melbourne. So, we're going to start off with this thing. It's called a Yagi antenna is this one here. Oh, I'll let you pass that around if I don't you. you can do what you want with that. And there we go. So you'll notice on the box, it says two things. It says lifetime manufacturer's warranty and 4G ready. All Matchmaster's Australian manufactured antennas come with a lifetime manufacturer's warranty. It's easy to, to actually access. It's on our main website on the further page. Just go in there put the customer details in there and you're done and dusted. Um, what we've found, particularly over the last couple of years, it's been a real 
bonus for contractors um, when they're actually installing Australian manufactured antennas. It's that point of difference between Australian and imported. And what's been interesting over the last few years is that the conversation, I know it always happens, is the conversation about money. How much is it going to cost me? And it still happens today. We, we get that. But the conversation's changed. That's what we know now. So what we're seeing is that a contractor who can be smart will offer good, better, best, with that one being best, and can add up to $200 to the cost of the install for an antenna that costs significantly less than that because of that perceived value. Now, how do these things work? Um, this one has got 21 elements on it. It's one of the biggest antennas that we do. And there's three bits to it that I want to just draw attention up to. Um, what we've got at the front are the reflectors. Those are the small, bit, small bits. Then we have the dipole. Now that's just that bit there. That's basically where the connection, that's where you connect up your RG6 to. And then we have the, di sorry, the reflectors at the back, sorry, and the, and the directors at the front. Got that the wrong way around. Um, and this one's got 21 elements. It includes the 4G filter. So that's the other thing on that box. Now, to, to conf what we mean by 4G in this case is actually anti-4G. So it's going to protect you against 4G interference. And that's a critical part today of, of what we need to have in a product. So any, this really is for anywhere in the outer suburbs. Now, I come up, came out this morning from South Gippsland, and there's, there's plenty over there if you head out west towards Hoppers Crossing, there's loads there. So what you tend to find in these areas, and I, I'm the same, is that there's a local transmitter, which no one wants to look at, because they all want the Melbourne channels. To do that, you're gonna need one of these. Now, I speak from experience, because I've got one of these on, on my roof at the moment. Um, it gives you double the power of a normal antenna. So Australian manufactured, 4G filter, double the power, outer suburbs for this particular one. Now, are you guys across what we mean when I say double the power? Pretty much it. So, everything that we do in our part of the world is measured in, in dB, and also in dB microvolt. Now, there's a lot of stories. When we do the six-hour training session, I can take you, take you through both, but for this, they're, they're pretty much the same. So, really, if we talk about an amplifier that has 20 dB gain, what that basically means in this case is that we're putting an input signal in of 30 dB and out it comes at 50 dB. So we're thinking, fine and dandy, great. But what does that actually mean? Now, later on today, when you leave this place, you're going to head off, you're going to get back in your vehicle, you're going to probably put some music on or talk station, anything else like that, and there's going to be something you want to listen to, and you're going to turn it up. And as you turn it up, it just turns up gradually, doesn't it? It's kind of like that. With TV, with every 3 dB that you add, you're doubling the power. So when you leave here, you're going to be walking up the stairs to get out of here, yep? Think of that as your power. Every time you take a step, that's 3 dB. You've doubled the power. Another step, 6 dB. You've doubled the power again. Another step. And eventually, you'll get to the stage where you can actually get... Such a huge increase in power. I mean, at the end of the day, 20 dB is a massive increase in power. So just bear that in mind. Every single time you're adding 3 dB to your signal in your distribution network, you're doubling the power. And that's why it's so critical to say to make sure that you have the right antenna and the right amp, because 3 dB can, can be that gap between success and having some problems. So on to the next one. We spoke about that one being pretty much the outer suburbs. We'll now head back into some of the inner suburbs. So this, again, you can get through. This is a log periodic antenna. Now, what's unique about log periodic antennas is that instead of having, as we saw before, directors and reflectors and a single dipole, here what we've got is every single one of these are actually dipoles themselves. And each dipole is cut to a different length. And the reason it's cut to a different length is because each one is designed for a particular frequency. Now, gain on log periodic is not that great, but there are areas in Melbourne that we know where, quite frankly, you put up a coat hanger and pick up a signal, and that's where these go very, very well indeed. So, particularly if you're going down the southeast, around sort of Dandenong, Dandenong and that sort of neck of the woods, Patterson Lakes, Carrum, everywhere around there, and again out west as well, anywhere here apart from the CBD, and we'll come on to that in a minute. So, this one does not have a lifetime warranty, but it does have a 4G filter. So, this unit is imported. It is not 
Australia manufactured, but it is a good low cost antenna in areas where you've got really good signal. So again, ticking much the, some of the inner suburbs. So I think this we covered already. So the point being though with, with gain is that, um, let's say for example, um, someone's not lined up the antenna completely correctly and they, they've lost three dB, then you have the power. The whole point about gain is that when you look at antennas, one of the best ways to judge how good they're going to be and where you're going to use them is to look at the gain. So effectively the way that gain works for a manufacturer such as Matchmaster is that there is a, a so-called standard, um, which is zero dB. And then any antenna basically that has gain of say three or four dB, you're doubling the power. If it's six dB, you're quadrupling the power. Nine dB, you're making it eight times the power and so on and so on. So the more gain an antenna has, the better it's going to be. The third one we're going to look at then is a phased array antenna. Now who can tell me where would you want to use a phased array antenna? Anyone know? What's one of them? Yep. CBD. Yeah, thank you. So this is a phased array antenna. Cause a phased array because you've got four vertically set up bars like that. Okay. Uh, when would you use this and where would you use it? CBD to start with, and we'll look at regional in a minute, but let's start with, with CBD. Um, in the CBD, we have a lot of signal reflection. Think of this as a Hoover. Think of a Yagi antenna like that DC21A as a torch or a lighthouse for that matter. And think of this as the Hoover. So with a Yagi antenna, what you're looking to do is you're looking at a point in the distance and you're focusing in on that point really, really tightly. With a phased array antenna, that's your Hoover. So what it's doing with the four vertical line bays there is it's actually then hover, hoovering up all the signal. Now, if we're in the CBD, we're going to get signal reflections. It can be off other buildings, it can be off cranes, can be off trams, can be anything. And what these are really good at is hoovering up the signal. So for regional areas, the question we always get asked is, well, for a regional area where we're looking to do get UHF, should I use a Yagi antenna or should I use the phased array antenna? And our answer to that is always look at the area around you. So for example, in a regional area and you're setting up and say on a farm and there's a lot of trees around that, the, the property, that's to say you should start thinking about a phased array. If on the other hand, there's clear sight to the transmitter, then that's where we say use a Yagi, and that's the difference between the two. So, anyone like to take a guess as to why on the screen now we've got it showing as uh, pointing up that way and that way at the bottom? Any particular reasons why that might be and where we'd use it? All right, so, this magic thing called polarity. So, why is that important to us? It's because there are two TV transmitters in the CBD. There's one on Burke Street, which is the newer one, and there's one on Chapel Street on the Channel 10 building. Both of those transmit in horizontal polarity. So what that means is that when you're using one of those and you're putting it up in the CBD, you need to swing it around by 90 degrees. It's the standard phone call that we, we get when, when we're talking to contractors. They'll, they'll ring us up and say, oh, Dave, you know, we put up your face around antenna. It's supposed to be the best of the best. It's okay, but it's not great. And we'll just get them to send a photo. And every time it's that. And always says, look, swing it around by 90 degrees. Give me a ring back. And it's like, oh, yeah, really well done. Awesome. And simply just down to getting the polarity right. Why do we have polarity? History. Um, Australia is one of the few countries in the world that has what's known as seven megahertz channels. So are you, all, are you all okay with when I talk about seven megahertz channels and what I'm getting at with that? So really what we're talking about there is the fact that each broadcaster is allocated a chunk of spectrum. And each bit of spectrum is seven megahertz wide. And, and that's, why in the, that's why seven's called seven and nine's called nine and ten's called ten. Because each chunk has a reference number, an ID number. Um, and seven got chunk seven, nine got nine, and ten got ten, and why the ABC's known two, because they got two. And they still get seven megahertz today. 
Um, most other countries around the world have 8 megahertz. We went for 7 because going back in the 1950s when we had a, a big country and a small population, we didn't see much air, air, sort of issues with any kind of interference with too many transmitters dotted around. Of course, as the country's grown, population has increased dramatically, more and more transmitters have come up, and we get start getting this interference problem. So the simple way around that, swing, it, swing the polarity around by 90 degrees, make it horizontal rather than vertical, off you go. So that's the reason why. It's just to be aware of it. And then the final one we had, you guys have seen one of these before. This is an omnidirectional antenna. It's a bit of fun, these. So this is a circular antenna. It's a size you see of about a large plate. It's got a massive amount of gain. We're talking about 15 dB gain on VHF, and I think it's 26 to 28 dB on UHF. When you compare that to a standard antenna, you know, like the Yagi there, the best of the best, when you're looking around 12 to 14 dB, depending on whether it's VHF or UHF, it, it makes a massive difference. Um, it's a powered antenna as well. Now, originally, when we launched this, we figured it would be really good for houseboats and grey nomads. Caravans, RVs, that kind of thing. What we find now, for every one that gets put onto a houseboat or onto an RV, nine are being put onto buildings. And the question is, well, why is that? The big, they go onto buildings where anywhere where the final customer is not allowed an antenna or, for aesthetic reasons, doesn't want an antenna on the roof. Now, normally, when you have that conversation with, with your customer, they'll probably say, oh, could you put it inside the roof space for me, please? There's a real simple answer to that, politely. No. Why not? Um, first of all, if you have a tin roof, TV signal does not transmit, go through tin. It just doesn't like it. Um, if it's a tar roof, you've still got insulation in that. What have you got inside the insulation? You've got steel wall. Same problem. And the amount of contractors we've spoken to, who, and we've all done it, have been to, oh, bugger it, we'll keep the customer happy, let's just do it. Put the antenna up inside the roof, it works fine because it's a beautiful sunny day in the middle of summer. Then Melbourne winter happens and the rain starts. And then remember we talk about the digital cliff, the gap between success and failure? That's your gap. As soon as that rain comes, boom, and back out they have to go with the very, instead, have a conversation with them about this. So this still goes outside, but it's small and it's discreet. Because it's omnidirectional, you don't have to be too fussy about where to point it. So you can pretty, you know, that you, with so long as you've got a, some sight of, of where the transmitter is, it's good, but otherwise you don't have to be too fussy. Um, so customers there would be, um, for example, anywhere, well, I'll give you one, they've improved it now, but over in Carrum Downs, you've got a, a big development there called Sandhurst. It's one of those ones, so, you know, it's a fiber optic thing around a, uh, set up which is around a golf club, so based around there, you've got heaps of houses all on fiber optic. Now, I stress it's fixed now, but 10 years ago it was anything but. And uh, they, but the body corporate said, no, because we've got fiber optic and because we want to maintain the aesthetic, should we say, of the whole thing, um, no antennas. So they said, fine, I don't have an antenna, I'll have one of those. The best inquiry we got was someone who asked, he said, um, could you put a little flashing red light on that? He said, what? yeah, cool, why? He said, so it looks like a burglar alarm. No. Brilliant. But that's, that's the market. The other market is people, if you're heading back towards, you know, around here, for example, Spencer Street, um, the majority of their developments around here have good TV, but there are a few which don't, some of the older ones. And so what a lot of folks do is they actually just put one of those onto their balcony, or the contractor puts it onto the balcony for them. Um, now, the question had to be, well, if this antenna is so damn good, why don't we just throw all the rest away? We'll get rid of everything single one of those and we'll have just those instead. Cost. That's why. So there's a radical difference in cost between one of those. So this is basically you get out a jail card for a customer who is either insisting on putting it on the roof, and the answer is no, um, or alternatively is um, looking to uh, just um, put it somewhere out of the way. Does that make sense? Anyone got any other questions about antennas? I'm just conscious of time. Yeah. 
All right, well, let's just look at, at mounts then. Uh, where are we going now? Sorry, what's that to our mounts? Oh, no, we're talking, we're talking about amps, actually. So, um, amplifiers. Uh, this is how are you guys across? I don't want to teach, teach you guys how to suck eggs. So, do you guys are you across how amplifiers actually work and how these get set up, or do you want me just to, to quickly run you through that? I know you would be, but do you want me just to quick run through? So, we'll start off with this one. So, amp comes out. Matchmaster amps come with the power supply. Okay, power supply is nice and simple. One of those. So that's your power supply. And it's your amplifier. Now on the amplifier, you've got an input for the antenna and you've got an output for the TV. And there are different amps depending on what antenna you're using. So this one here is for, for example, the DC21A because it's going for UHF and VHF, which is the main uh, which is basically the, where the frequencies are for Matt Dandenong. If you're going for the CBD, which is the MDU50 there, the phased array, there you need a UHF one, okay? And this one, as you see, has got adjustable gain. So the question has to be, how do we power these up? And where would that power supply go? Anyone want to tell me? Thank you. Yeah, exactly right. So how this works, you'll see on that, is that you've got... On the, uh, you've got a smart little gizmo there, which basically gives you um, an input and an output. So it's going to do two things. What it's going to do is it's going to send 14 volts up the coax, so the coax can carry 14 volts. It's going to go through the splitter, and it's going to power up the amp. Sometimes we get asked, well, can we put them in, into the roof space? The answer is, yeah, sure. Not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. The key thing to bear in mind when, when you're putting this in, though, is just to think about your splitter, because these days it's very rare to have a home which has just got one point. So typically you've got two, three, four, six, eight points, and so you're splitting. If they've got an older splitter up there, it's probably going to only have power pass on one port. In other words, it's only going to sell, send that 14 volts through on one port. So what we'd strongly recommend at that stage is actually upgrade the splitter to power pass all ports, and that way then, what that means is that you're not going to get that annoying phone call which has always been where you've set everything up, it's glorious, they ring up and say there's no signal at all. As soon as you say no signal at all, we know that they've disconnected the amp. Because if you, don't, if you have an amp, but it's not powered up, it's not you have low signal, you have no signal. And they've done that because for whatever, they don't understand what it is, and they try plugging in next to another TV. Now, if you've got a power pass on all ports for your splitter, that's not a problem, because it, it'll still send the, the actual 14 volts through. If, on the other hand, you've only got it on a single port and they move it, then you're in trouble. By the way, if any of you do estate agents and rentals, it's, I'm sure you're across this one already, it's, it's the best one. It's the best one. The estate agent rings up and says, oh, they've got no TV, but they've got an antenna. All that's happened is the previous tenant they moved out just disconnected the power supply. They don't know what it is. It's a case of just go in there with a cup of coffee and a newspaper. Plug it in, have your coffee, half an hour later, job done, thank you. It's just straight away, as soon as I say that, that's, that's really what it is. So um, that's basically amplifiers, and like I said, there are different ones. Um, this one here is it's known as a Joey, by the way. It, it's actually uh, from a European supplier called Johansson. Um, the difference, we, we do basically this one, and we import, or sort of we import our own as well from China, like everyone else. The difference between the Joey and the normal ones is that you know, we spoke about that antenna being a get out of jail card. The, uh, the Joey's your get out of jail card for amps as well. Why is it a, good, a get out of jail card? It's because where the Joey's are good is at clearing up all the crap. So what happens when you amplify a signal? You're amplifying two things. You're amplifying signal and you're amplifying noise. And there's noise in every signal. It's, it's a fact of life. So if you over amplify noise, you can actually make things worse. That's why, and you see some of the weekend warriors do this, is, is that they'll go and spend thousands of dollars on the latest LEDs, and then instead of getting a professional installer out, we'll actually go and buy one of those um, sort of amplifiers that you stick by the TV, and then wonder why it's all gone to, gone to The reason it's done that is because you've actually put the amplifier noise. It's just a fact of life. And what they've done is they've amped up the noise so much it's killed the signal, which is why you always have the amp before 
the splitter. Um, so just wanting to be aware of that as well. Um, the Joey though, going back to why that's so good is because with the noise, it actually filters out the noise on either side. So there are areas around Melbourne which are like the, we call them the installer's graveyard. Um, out east, Listerfield is one. If you, I'll give you a word of advice. If you ever get off, asked to do a job in Listerfield, think very hard about it and then take at least three antennas with you. It, it's just the way it is. It's just a really nasty place to be. So, so be aware of that um, and then make sure you're going to use the Joeys. They're just much better at clearing, clearing up the mess. So what we suggest always is when you're going out to a job, um, have a range of standard amps, but also make sure you've got at least one Joey for that particular job or a Joey for every job because it will get you out of trouble. I can guarantee you that. Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, the, everything. Um, running, it's, it's both getting the power up to it and, and getting signal back down. Same with ribbon cable, a similar thing as well. We're, again, and I know it, it's the perfect one I'm talking about. We just magically remove it and magically put new coax in as RG6. But yeah, that's really probably what we'd have to strongly recommend. And, uh, I mean, the other way you can do it in that situation, I guess, is you can run it down the outside of the property if you need to. Just remember to put the drip loop in at the bottom so that the, uh, the water doesn't flow into the, the coax. How am I doing for time? So, okay, with this one we already covered off. So like I said, the, so if you're using the, the phase or antenna, just be aware that there's a UHF version for that. The form factor and how it works is exactly the same. It's purely just for UHF. So, Suggestion we make is, is, is a nice, easy way just to think through, well, what antennas do I need for a job? So we call that good, better, best. And this actually now comes down to how you grow your business and, and what levels of margin you want to make. And, who, and of course, obviously, the customer you're talking to. So if you're talking about a customer who, who, for whatever reason, does not want to spend a huge amount of money but still requires a, a good solution, what we suggest is the log periodic, log periodic antenna, the LPO3, along with the imported amplifier, the MA30 PDF, which is that one there. Again, as you can see, the form factor is exactly the same. So that's a good one. A better one, now we say here the DR3006. Now, radio parts have a really good antenna here, um, which I want to draw attention to. It's their version of the DR3006. So this is the DR3006. It's Australian manufactured, has a lifetime manufacturer's warranty, costs just a few dollars more than a log periodic, but the perceived value is so much higher. And so what's happened for Matchmaster, and again, COVID's had a lot to do with this, I can tell you that now, is that the desire to actually install Australian has gone through the roof. So I'd strongly recommend, talk to the guys here about the V36 4G. It's the same one of those. It's just got a, a light, nice radio parts color boom on it. Um, the great thing about it, it's a Yagi antenna. It's Australian manufactured, lifetime manufacturer's warranty. Has a similar level of gain, in fact, to the DC21.8. It's just a little bit less. But trust me, unless you're going to the very outer suburbs, that's the go-to antenna. Now, talk to Daniel about the price, but I can, I can tell you now, that we know, speaking to all the contractors, that they can easily add $100 to the cost of the install just by actually putting one of those in. So I want you to just, please just be aware of that. It's, it's one that is what we need to just look at a bit more. Um, the DR3006 or the V36 4G is this one. So again, you'll see lifetime warranty. You know what a lot of smart installers do, which I really like? They actually take that into the building and show it to the customer and show the lifetime warranty and show the Australian manufacturing and everything else like that. And then what they do, the, the one, there's one guy, I love him, what he does is he actually, because that takes about 30 seconds to put together, um, we also have, in a, uh, the, there's a bag version as well, but the, the, the 4G takes about 30 seconds to put together. He actually shows the customer how he puts it together. It's like, look at me, I'm the expert at what I do. This is why you're paying me top dollar for this. And then he goes ahead and installs it. And then where necessary uses an amp as well. So just a, just a tip there. Um, so that's your good better. And then finally the best obviously then would be the, the big Yagi antenna, the DC21A 
and the Joey. So that's basically going to cover your Melbourne suburb. So anywhere which is coming off Mount Dandenong. So that's anywhere apart from the CBD. Now there are some areas, um, Footscray is definitely still covered in CBD, Dockland is definitely CBD. As you go further out, sometimes you do have a choice, and I'll show you a little bit later on, depending on how we do on time, to the antenna selection guide, how that works. But we do the same thing then for the CBD, and bear in mind again, because of polarity, we've swung the antenna around by 90 degrees. We do that, which will be ever good, a better and a best. Now, fortunately, radio parts stock the best, which is the MDU-50. Um, so that's the one we just say, look, just go for that. Again, it's got the 4G filter on there, um, rock solid, nicely built, easy to put together. And then for regional Vic, we spoke about the difference between hoovering up signal, we need a lot of signal reflection, and then actually really focusing on a point in the, in the distance, a bit like a torch, almost, or almost like a, it's got a kind of like a, a lighthouse, but in reverse, where you're actually sucking that signal in. Um, that's again where we have these ones in. I haven't brought these with me today, but um, we had basically have uh, Yagi antennas, again, all lifetime warranties. Um, that actually now has a lifetime warranty as well. And again, we have Joey's, the Joey amps, which are for your really tricky areas, and then we have your imported amps as well. So if any of you guys need to have this, I can email it to you if you want this bit emailed to you. It's just that, so you have it on the truck, you think of what antennas do I need. This is just a quick and easy way just to work out what it is. Now, um, I'm just, how are we doing for time, Daniel? Ooh, okay. Um, five minutes, right. Um, I think this we've all covered off. Everyone's across tripods, mounts, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so we'll, this is more just uh, um, coax and tools, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you one thing, just, have you guys ever seen Quick Connects? Do you know what those are? The ones where you don't have to peel back the braid? No? I'll just give you a quick look, at, quick look at one of these. and we, Afterwards, we can, if you want to have a play, come have a play. So normally when you're... Let's grab one of those then. Grab one of those. So, what do you do when you're out to actually basically put together something like that? Um, you're going to cut. You're going to strip. This, I love this stripper. It's, it's one of my favourites. It's got a little arrow for idiots like me. You can't remember which way to point the thing. So we're going to do... Actually, still got a bit in there. Put that through like that. What we do is just spin a few times like that. Bring it back in. Bang. Oh, okay. Easy. Anyone can do that. The next bit's the pain in the neck. It's the peeling back the braid. Takes 30 seconds to a minute. Bugs your thumbs up like there's no tomorrow. This one, we don't do it. All we do... Slide that on, just make sure that's about right. That's just a little bit too long. Just cut that back a bit. You want basically it to be just peeking out like that. We got our tool. Slide that in. I'm trying to do this in the dark, never helps. There we go. Compress. Bang. Job done. Now, how did it peel back the braid? Compare the two. Oh, look, pass that around. You want to. You'll see how one, yeah, you pass around if you want to. one's much, the one I've compressed is much shorter, and as I've compressed it, it peels back the braid automatically for you. Now, if you're doing 10, 15, 20 of these a day, that's a lot of your life you're about to get back there, not to mention your thumbs as well. It's a compression connector. Does everyone understand why a compression connector would be better than a crimp connector? Two reasons. Um, first, a compression connector does not lose signal as, as much as a crimp connector will. So a, a good compression connector like one of those will lose you at most around half a dB. A crimp connector will lose you at least one dB. A poorly fitted crimp connector will lose you up to two, to two and a half. Now bear in mind we said if you lose three dB, you're halving the power. The other main one, and this is 4G mobile phone interference, these things. The, the spectrum that was sold off by the government is at the top end of the UHF spectrum. And that's now used for 4G mobile phone services. All the TVs that come into Australia have tuners that will pick up those 4G mobile phone signals. They typically you'll find them on channel 61. If you've got a signal meter and you've got, you're scanning across, it jumps up like that 
And that's channel 61, and that's your 4G. Now, a poorly fitted fly lead with a crimp connector is a mini antenna. And it will pick up the 4G mobile phone signal. Now, there's two areas of getting 4G. The first is the uplink, and the second is the downlink. So the other suggestion we make, by the way, when you're doing a job, um, when you're up on the roof, might be better just to turn the data off. 4G is just data, it's not voice. But the point being is that the closer you get to an antenna with a 4G mobile phone, the worse the interference gets. So it can actually, times can actually completely screw up your, your signal when you're actually trying to use a signal meter. So just be aware of that. Um, and then the same thing again is that you'll find them is that if they're down in the lounge, and it's again a typical thing, they've spent thousands of dollars and got off and bought a cheap fly lead or they try to make one themselves. That's become a TV antenna and that's pulled into the signal. So just be aware of that and that's why you should use those. Apart from the fact that they're a lot easier to use, it's a better solution. It just protects against 4G. What else do you want me to cover? Because I'm acutely conscious of time here. Yeah. Yeah, um, splitters I think we covered off. We mentioned just splitters. Obviously, try and use power pass all ports these days if you can. Either match master ones or anyone you're getting from radio parts, but just yes, just, just get it with power pass all, port, all ports. Uh, taps, you guys across taps. So, okay, taps like a splitter with a brain. So that's where, let's say you're doing a gym. You're able to do a gym. Um, let's say you've got 20 exercise machines they want free to air to every single one, and you've got lots of different cable runs. What you can do there is just use taps that basically put out different levels of signal. So the lower level of signal you put out, you put to the machines that are closer to the amp, and then the ones that are furthest away, that's where you put out the most signal. So taps, what they do is they balance a system. And again, with our six hour training, we do a lot of that. Uh, HDMI and stuff, I think we've covered, just to make you aware. Of do you guys use ball nose at all? So these are just some of the, the top selling ones that we do at the moment. So the advantage of the Matchmaster ball nose one is that it actually, if you want, open it up if you want to, um, you can actually remove the, the ball nose. Makes it really easy to work with. Um, and we do those in, in black as well. And then finally, of course, there, there's HDMI and everything else like that now. I know that um, obviously radio parts have a lot of this themselves, but if there's anything you want to look at, take a look now. I've thrown a lot of information at you in the space of 45 minutes. How the hell do I expect you to remember that? The answer is I don't, um, because I've got a tool which I can show you which can actually do all this for you. So just give me a moment. So if you need to remember this, just remember the, the Matchmaster website or just Google Matchmaster and it will take you there. There's a thing here called the Antenna Selection Guide or matchmaster.tv. This does all the work for you. This will work for you when you're on the job because it'll work on your, it's basically just a web page. So it'll work on your phone, on your iPad, on your desktop, on your laptop, whatever. So you can use this either the night before you get on the job or you go, so what we start off with is an address. Does anyone want to give me an address? Any preferences or? 562 Spencer Street. 562, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, 562 Spencer Street, there we go. Now, how many TV outlets do you want? We can go anywhere from two through to 16. How many do you want? So around even eight. Eight's <laughs> good, all right. Now, if it's okay with you, I'm not gonna click apartment or body core because that's gonna take us straight to the, uh, the omnidirectional antenna. Uh, do you want Foxtel with that or not? Yeah. Yep, okay, uh, And do you want any FM radio with that? Yeah. How many? Four. Four, done, right. So, just a few seconds just to put that information in. And we'll just see how, how good this cell phone gear is. There we go. So straight away, it's going to tell you the antenna. There you go, it's the MDU-50, and notice how it's swung around by 90 degrees because of the polarity, okay? It's also going to tell you all the parts that you need, and it's going to give you a little diagram. Some installers I know actually email that to the customer. Again, it's all about how do you grow your business? How do you actually develop your margins? What is it that makes you different from other, other, other installers out there? What makes you the expert? And this is one of those. Um, the other thing it does, which is pretty cool, it's linked in with Google Earth. Sorry. So we just have to bring that back around again. 
So, excuse me, right. we are right now here, your transmitter's there, okay? So I'm telling you straight away, and it, what we do, and again, the, you know, I mentioned that, that customer was out in Regional Vic, we, we knew he was pointing to the the wrong way. We know that because he gave me the address, I went to the internal selection guide, zoomed in on where it was and said, mate, he said, we should, you know, I said, where are you pointing? He said, you see that golf course over there? I said, yep. He said, I'm pointing towards the golf course. I said, well, mate, you want to go completely the opposite direction. And we use that to, it's so simple to use. Um, now, what we can do, I'll just come out of it. It also has a map function on that, but what it also tells us is which way to point the antenna. So if you've got a compass app on your phone, great. One word of advice with a compass app on your phone, please just make sure it's really well calibrated. They're not great. In, you know, I'm, I know I'm an old bastard, but sometimes it's actually better to actually take a, uh, just an old-fashioned compass up with you. It's just easier rather than having to muck around trying to, to you know, calibrate your phone. So just you basically 145 degrees where you're going to point it, or just 1.2 away. Um, the signal is 71 dB, because obviously here it's going to be huge. Um, and the digital channels are 40 to 45. So it tells you everything you need. It tells you which way to point the antenna, which polarity of the antenna you, that you need, in other words, 90 degrees or, or straight up, the signal you're going to get, um, plus all the items you need. So the other thing you can do, of course, with that is when, before you do the job, just make a, you know, a note of all the bits and pieces you need. Now, when you come in to, to speak to, to Daniel and the team, that's all the gear you need. So the amps, in, the, in this case, we don't need an amp, so it's not going to tell you an amp. So now, um, finally, because I'm not we're just five minutes over, aren't we now? Mention 71 dB. Now that's the 71 dB that's coming off the stick. In other words, we got off the stick off the transmitter, and it's huge because we're only just a you know 1.2 kilometres away. But who can tell me what level of dB I need at the wall plate? Any idea? What, what, sorry? Yeah, that's right. So 55 to 65 is what we say. Now, just be aware that too much signal is as, ba as bad as too little signal. So for example, if you go, for example, here we're talking about 70 dB. Now let's say I was having a, you know, a mad moment and I said to myself, oh, I'm going to amplify the crap out of that. I'm going to bang a 24 dB amp on there, take it up to, that'd be 70, that'd be up to 95 dB. And then I'm going to chuck that into the TV and see what happens. The TV is just going to go, nah, it'll just not do it. I, the most extreme I saw years ago, so it was actually before I was at Matchmaster, I have to state, um, where I was with a guy and he was actually just testing out this brand new, and it was some seriously powerful head end gear um, for a big cable TV network. It had a massive output. And he, again, he had just one of those moments of madness. He actually connected this directly to the TV. It was quite cool. We had this and a <laughs> and smoke just going like that. And it was the tuner guy. Now, you're never going to get that in the real world. You, you have to have a particular brand of lunacy to attempt to do that. But the point I'm getting at is it, it, it's not going to damage the tuner. But what it will do is that uh, too much signal is bad, as bad as too little signal. So it's always that 55 to 65 dB. Um, now, obviously, in the perfect world, you have your signal meter, so you take your readings at the, at the, uh, the wall plate. Having said that, the other way you can do it if you, if, you, if you left your meter behind, 71 dB there. Um, typically we know, just a ball, ballpark, is that for every 10 metres of coax you lose 2 dB. So let's say with this one, we've got 71 dB coming in, we've got gain on the antenna, and so we're going to be using the phased array, so that's around 9 dB, so it's going to give us 80 dB coming off the antenna. So after that then, we basically got around 25 to 30 dB to play with. So, so long as we're looking at, should we say, let's say we've got a splitter in there, it's going to lose about 7 or 8 dB. Uh, we've got, say, 10 metres of coax, so it's going to lose us another 2, so it's going to take us down to the 60s. So, so, you want to just make sure it's between 55 and 65. Quick little trick, if you have, find you actually have too much signal and you have plenty of coax in the van, one way to do it, if you don't have an attenuator, which is kind of like a reverse amplifier, to take signal out, the quick cheat is basically to, to just gently or carefully bundle up a whole reel of coax in the roof space, because like I said, for every 10 metres of coax, you're losing 2 dB. So if you want to lose 4 dB and you don't know how to do it, we'll just grab 20 metres of coax and just wrap it around in a gentle coil and, and off you go. Um, any questions? I'm, I'm throwing a huge amount at you. For those who want to stay a bit longer, if we've got time or later on, there's another bit I can do actually about distribution systems, but um, 
today was just talking about introducing two antennas and amps. No. Any questions? Cool. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. Mm.